Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered unto them, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch ye therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Our Father who art in heaven, we come to you through the merits of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and we praise you this morning because of who you are and what you're striving to accomplish in our lives. We thank you for that most ancient compact and promise that very first meeting on the plan of redemption where you and your son promised eternal life to those who would choose you. We come this morning with nothing in ourselves worthy of notice. And so we plead for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in our hearts that we might be discerners, quick discerners of truth that we might prepare characters fit to walk and talk among the society of holy angels who keep your commandments. I pray, Father, this morning for each one represented here for their homes that you will come and be with each one of us. And may we, together as a class this morning, as we open the word, may we be discerners of truth Teach us thy way, O Lord. For we have been raised in a generation of rebellion. We've been raised by forefathers who have rejected the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. We've been raised to think that right is wrong and wrong is right. And we know we're told that the track of truth lies close to the track of error and only minds and hearts that are filled with your spirit will be able to discern the difference father as we study this ten virgin parable this morning we want to be among the wise so we plead for an outpouring of your spirit this morning to help us speak to each heart and tell each one what you would have us to do, we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Before we 
we begin our Sabbath school study this morning, I just first want to say, because it's been coming in via phone and emails, that we do not hate Uriah Smith. Did he repent? <laughs> we do not know. There may look like there are some uh, things from the prophetess that has him a repentant man that we should follow all of his writings. But we here in this ministry have found that there were changes made in the spirit of prophecy. And Sister White told us if we wanted to be spiritually discern, uh, discerning of these things in the last days, we would have to understand that Jeremiah 36 would be repeated. It has been repeated. And we have found that people who strive to take everything printed and copyrighted by the church at large are very confused, number one, on who and what is the church, number two, on exactly what is truth, on a lot of doctrines. And so here in this ministry, like I said, we don't hate Uriah Smith. We are just striving to help you, to give you the tools to help you understand what your father and mother could have understood. Because as Froome, the Jesuit Masonic infiltrator of Adventism, who for 40 years strove to put down the spirit of prophecy in every way he could, when Arthur realized he was winning with the multitudes, he put out in um, 1954 Mess Ellen G. White, Messenger to the Remnant, and he shares in there the rejection of the spirit of prophecy by Uriah Smith and others, the Committee of Five that he chaired in 1883, that Uriah Smith was chairman of, to rework the spirit of prophecy to make it orthodox with their beliefs. And then, of course, came, out came the Spirit of Prophecy treasure, Treasury Chest in 1960 that went forth from the Voice of Prophecy. It gave the same information. It tells of Willie um, saying, Oh, God, why did you make my mother the prophet? He was, he was distressed about that. He also, uh, Arthur also shares in here, and, of course, he was paid by the White Estate so he's very careful, but the discerning heart can realize Willie was not on board with his mother. He said, my mother has been given negative messages from God about men in high positions that are walking away from the Lord. And I'm just decided that I am going to put forth every effort to bring before mother's attention the other side, the positive, where a brother is getting along with brother. I'm going to bring that to her attention. And I really don't believe we need all of these testimonies. And that's why the 30 pamphlets went down to nine volumes, because Willie and his wife worked on those. And that's why they sent it to a committee to get a committee of five together where they could change the spirit of prophecy. This whole understanding for us gotten from these books and other sources has helped us to fast track into obtaining all the truth we can because as we've been bringing out in these lessons doctrine matters you cannot believe doctrines of devils and go to heaven we have to understand and be discerners of the truth at this time so i just wanted to say that there is no blank check ever given in the original spirit of prophecy writings or the Bible that Laodicea, the last and final church, is going to go through to glory. Many leaders wrote all through the years that she would go through, she would not be spewed out. Even uh, Andreasen, M.L. Andreasen wrote that in a review, much to our distress as we read that here not long ago. But that is not what we find in the Bible and the true spirit of prophecy. So we pray that you can be discerners of, of truth and that you will understand it's truth we love. It's the truth we love. And we're just trying to share these truths so that your walk with the Lord 
can hasten a bit and you can be prepared to stand in the great day of the Lord because it's here. Now, before we get into our lesson, Jane wanted to... Oh, excuse me. We've got a question. Yes, Sister Debbie? Who keeps muting me? <laughs> oh, anyway. Me, oh, I'm I sorry. Just want, I, I just wanted to say that in the writings it says we are to love what God loves and hate what God hates. That's part of being a Christian. Correct. That's how we become a friend of God. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's true. And uh, before I forget, Mark said Tuesday night, I said in my prayer, um, we pray for those who are, are dead. I did not finish my sentence. I remember saying that, but I did not finish my set. Who have become dead. Excuse me. I meant to say, for the, because we don't pray for the dead. I meant to say in my prayer, for those who have become dead spiritually, we lift those up to the throne of grace. Somehow, may the Holy Spirit reach those people. So, if you think, oh, Melanie's praying for the dead, I'm sorry. I was so tired, I didn't finish my sentence, and I just wanted to clear that up. And now, Sister Jane has something to um, share with us before we get into our lesson. Melanie, we both had trouble making ourselves clear during prayer on Tuesday night. Last Tuesday evening at prayer meeting, during the prayer, I said something that I need to clarify. I want no understanding about what I meant. God always does what is best in response to our prayers. So when I asked him, do your best, I was only referring to what he always does. Sometimes in our prayers, we're the ones who need to be changed, not others. We may be looking for a request to be answered in a particular way. But when we ask for his will, not ours to be done, our Father in heaven, who knows the end from the beginning, clearly knows what will be the results of what we ask for. Amen. And he knows what is best for the requests we make. Uh, he works with people, always allowing for their free will. And while we wait to see the answers to our prayers, we must remember that they may be answered after we die and are removed from the scene. He's always working for the best good of souls. And when I say in prayer, do your best, I'm giving complete submission to his will. Amen. Not to mine. And that's where and we that's should be. I, it reminds me of Debbie brought this up uh, some weeks back about Sister White praying for three friends early on in her life, praying that they would be healed because they were all three were very deathly sick. They all got well. But they all walked away from the Lord after that. And No, only two. Only two of them. Excuse me. Okay. Only two of them, uh, um, two walked away from the Lord. And this is why we don't plead, plead, plead. Um, that's why we if don't. If they plead. had died at that point, yeah. they would have been saved. Right. So this is why we don't plead, plead, plead for things to go for our, our way. Please help them get well. You know, because... Um, we don't know what the Lord has in mind and what those individuals will turn and do at the end. So we need, like you said, to have a submissive prayer. Thank you, Jane. Okay, we are on Lesson 3 in our uh, Ten Virgin Parable booklet by Anna DeMichael, uh, the Sabbath School Lesson Guides that you can find on Hohen Research Library. Um, I think they're down near the bottom of his list of publications because these aren't numbered. But um, we're in the first book and we're on lesson three, which is page seven in that booklet. Is it page seven? No, I think, Melanie, that it's, I'm going to double check, but I think that that document is right at the top of the list with the oh. version Oh, okay, right okay. The very top. I'll check. It's the dark red one. And it's um, sideways. <laughs> it's sideways instead of longer like the others. So here in Lesson 3, we start out, Since the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, because he's the spirit of truth. Remember, we read that quote last week. Do we have any clues as to who the foolish might be who are recorded as unready? They have no oil. They are destitute of the Spirit of God. Do we have any clues? We have clues everywhere. I don't think we're going to get through this lesson today, folks. 
because of all the clues we've got. Um, this document is the second document on the publication page. Okay, thank you, Mark. Could you hear him? This document is the second document on the publication page in um, the okay. Hohen Research Library. Dot org. Dot org. So, number three, here we are. Let's turn to the Questionable Doctrines book. <laughs> She says, the foolish new catechism. And um, Anna's the one we um, inherited Hohen Research Library from. And in speaking with her, she was raised a Catholic. She came into the church just six years, I believe it was, three or six years before questions on doctrines came out. And this is a little lady who whose husband was a doubter, big time. He was a Catholic as well, and he was a doubter. And so she told me, she said, I had to study, study, study everything because Patsy was constantly saying, how do you prove that? How do you prove that? And so she got to know her Bible very well. Well, then along comes 1958, um, Questions on Doctrines. And she read this book and marked this book. She was absolutely shocked. She said to me, I was so upset. I cried. I didn't eat for three days. I cried and cried and cried because this was the doctrines of Catholicism I, that I had come out of. So that's why she wrote these lessons. And this is why she says um, the foolish new catechism. She calls it a catechism because she, she had the spiritual discernment to understand this was a rush back to Rome for the Church of Adventism, and it grieved her deeply. So here it says um, on page 381, that where she refers us to, she, it, she says here, she quotes from here, and I'll read a little bit more. It says, redemption absolute by the vic victory of Christ. Well, if redemption was absolute... By, uh, by the victory of Christ, which it is for the believer, but that doesn't mean for everyone. Um, so their very title is, is um, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about it. Christ is the absolute victory. His absolute victory is for those that, that have submitted to his will. As Jane spoke about earlier, we need to submit to Christ's will. So it says here, Jesus, our surety, entered the holy places and appeared in the presence of God for us. But it was not with the hope of obtaining something for us at that time or at some future time. No, he had already obtained it for us on the cross. And so she quotes this because this is the "twas all finished at the cross" doctrine that came out of Catholicism. Um, they uphold the cross, and that's it. Uh, this is definitely um, a doing away with the sanctuary message that um, the Advent movement was founded on in 1844 when Christ moved from the holy place into the most holy. It totally annihilates the need for an atonement or a finishing of the work in heaven right there in questions on doctrines. So what did Jesus not obtain for us on the cross according to this, his own teaching? Somebody want to read the top of... Um, page 8 in our booklet. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, better, or to your advantage for you that I go away, or if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. John sixteen seventeen. Seven. Obtains nothing for us. So, Pardon? obtains nothing for us. So, it wasn't all finished at the cross. 
that was just one portion of the work of redemption. The work of the the plan of salvation has been carried on for 6,000 years. And Christ coming and living among men and giving himself to die, the ignominious death on the cross, was only the first phase of that work. Um, and so here, he has promised his disciples that, he says, um, I'm going away and... I have to in order for you to obtain something better. So let's look at this a minute. Let's look at John 14, verse 16. John 14, 16 through 30, actually. Somebody want to read those first two verses there, 16 and 17? Do I have a reader? You're all muted if someone's reading. You said 15 to 17 on verse um, 74? Yes, please. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another, another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So here he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. And so... Let's read on. Somebody take 18 and 19. Or, excuse me, 19 and 20. <laughs> do you want to do it? Go ahead. You're on, Deb. 18 and 19? 19, 19 and 20. Yet a, <clears throat> a little while in the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live. Ye shall also live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and yet in me, and I in you. And ye in me, and I in you. Thank you. Okay, 21 and 22. Someone? He that hath my commandment and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall <coughs> be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and he will manifest me <coughs> and will manifest myself to him. Thanks. Judas said unto him, not it. Not as scary as it is. Thank you. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? So here, Judas, not as scary as he asked the question, Lord, how are you going to do this? How are you going to show yourself to us and not the world? And here's Jesus' answer. Do I have a reader for the next two verses? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my saying, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. Amen. Thank you. And somebody read 25 and 26. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Thank you, Sister Ree. 
and someone for 27 and 28. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Leave, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and I come again unto you. If he loved me, he would rejoice, because I said, I go in unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Thank you. 29 and 30. Well, just read the next three, whoever has it. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Thank you. So, if we understand this, Christ is saying, those who keep the commandments of God have the Father and Him abiding with them. This is how we understand if we're disciples or not. And when Judas asked this question, how can you do this? How can you come and abide? How can you send your spirit to abide with us and not with the world? It's simple. He can only stay with those who strive to show their love through obedience. And so then it goes into John 15, which, which is beautiful. He says, I am the vine. My father's the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. Have you felt purged? Have you felt trials lately? Has it been hard for you because you call yourself a Christian? Rejoice because God and his son love you so much. They're purging you. He says, those that I love, I rebuke and chasten. So don't fall under that stroke. In verse um, 4, he says, abide in me. What does abide mean? What does abide mean? Stay. You're right. It means to stay, to live, to dwell. So it's not just a thing of popping in once a week and spending three or four hours and saying, <laughs> I did my weekly duty. Uh, Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I love you. I love you. And going on your way and going back into all the worldly things of the world that so absorb our attention. We're to stay, we're to abide in Christ. How do we do that? By meditating on His Word. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So Jesus claims those ten commandments as his, that are his Father's, because his, his, he has the same desire, the same spirit as his Father. He came from his Father. Beautiful passages. He did not give his spirit until after he had gone back to heaven. And John 14, 6. Let's look at John 14, 6. Again. No, we didn't read it. John 14, 6. Somebody want to read that? Jesus said I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Someone want to read um, 
obtains nothing for us in our book. Obtains nothing for us from the above we see Cleveland that the Holy Spirit, the power to discern truth, the oil of grace and character, the transformation, the power to transform hearts would not and could not come until and unless he went to his father. Why is that? We find the answer in John 7, 37 to 39. John 7, 37 to 39. Do I have a reader? John 7, 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Ghost was not given before the cross. It was not given before his ascension because Christ had not yet been glorified. Sister White comments on these on this in two letters, two different letters. Um, the first one being to Brother Curtis and the second being to John Harvey Kellogg and his wife. Um, the first written in 1891, the second in 1897. And you'll find these in 14 MR 179 and 12 letter MS uh, 138, 1897. And it says this, It is not essential for you to know and be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, and the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth which the Father shall send in my name. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he am may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth in you, and shall be with you. John fourteen sixteen and 17. This refers to the omnipresence of, of the Spirit of Christ called the Comforter. And the second letter, in giving his commission to his followers, Christ did not tell them they would be left alone. He assured them he would be near them. He spoke of his omnipresence in a special way. Go to all nations, he said. Go to the farthest portion of the habitable globe, but know that my presence will be there Labor in faith and confidence, for the time will never come when I will sh shall forsake you. The assurance of his abiding presence was the richest legacy Christ could give his disciples. Having the high priest of our profession close by our side, we need not imperil our souls by opening the secrets of our heart to priest or minister. In all confidence, we may open our heart to the head over all the church. Take every matter, small and great, to Jesus. Come unto me, he says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. It's one we used to sing when I was a child. Precious assurance, let us show that we honor the invitation by obeying the call. So, it was not all finished at the cross. Christ promised to send the Holy Spirit to comfort our hearts. We don't need to go to priest or prelate or shrink 
or minister, we can go straight to the throne of grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Precious Spirit of God, may our prayer be that of David in Psalm 51.11, I think it is, where he said, Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Okay, do I have another reader for the bottom of page 8 there, the large um, um, paragraph? We pause here. We pause here to emphasize that the reader can himself remember and find many most precious promises in the Bible and in the testimonies following the work of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And here we find a clear-cut doctrine that Christ said all power was given to him in heaven and in earth, and that he even controls the Holy Spirit, that God grants help only to those who worship him in spirit and in truth. I pray not for the world, John 17, 9. The world is in midnight darkness, Yet can it, it can be truthfully said that even the worldly churches have gone as far as the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to teach such a presumptuous blasphemy against the Holy Ghost as to say that Christ obtains nothing for us when here we find that he told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they received power from on high, something they had never received before something that Christ received for them from the Father, as well as all power, and this was after the cross. Not only that, but they had to tarry until Christ had been glorified by the Father after the cross. Yes, thank God, we can truthfully say that God receives, that Christ receives something after the cross. And he gave us something after the cross. Amen. Amen. And now I can understand why you have denominations filled with people who do not believe in overcoming through the blood of the Lamb. Because if you believe this doctrine, we read in this Questions on Doctrines that was all finished at the cross. You are destitute of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of grace, that still small voice that says, no, 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 this is the way, walk ye in it. You've you've stilled that voice. And that's why we find in Revelation, Christ knocking on the outside of the door of Laodicea, asking for entrance, because he's not there. The Holy Spirit is not there. How often are we to receive from heaven? How often are we to receive from heaven? Once a week? Let's look at um, Psalms. Continuously. Right. Psalms. uh, Let's get it from Scripture. You're right. But let's get a a text behind it. Psalm 61.8. Psalm 61.8. How often are we to receive the grace of the Holy Spirit from heaven? Psalm 61.8. Do I have a reader? So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Daily. Correct? We're to sing praises daily to perform my vows to God. And let me just say... It's through singing, it's through singing that we overcome the tempter. When we start singing the praises of God, he can't stand it, he has to leave. Psalm 55, 17 gives us a little more insight. Do I have a reader? Psalm 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Thank you. You know... This is a text 
uh, one of the texts, it, there's also one in Jeremiah that talks about those who call not upon the name of the Lord morning and evening are classed with the heathen. When Mark and I read those texts years ago, like when we were first cast out of the church, must have been, what, 29 years ago? Um, we decided we needed to do something daily. As we were reading the word together, and we decided we should do something. And so we started studying on it and just found a wealth of information on evening and morning worship, a family worship. And so we started a family worship program. And several years into that, he went back to those notes and he did them for a sermon. And people came to him and they said, and lifelong um, believers, and they said, We've never heard of such a thing. We really like your idea. That's interesting. Evening and morning worship. It's biblical. In fact, those who call not as a family, those who call not upon the name of the Lord daily, um, are classed with the heathen. I should have looked that verse up. Um, Psalm 119, 148. Psalm 119, 148. Got you three witnesses this morning. Do I have a reader? My eyes began to night watches that I might meditate in thy word. Thank you. Now read 151 and 152 for us as well, please, sister. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are true. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that old, that thou hast founded them forever. So these are the things we're to meditate on. The testimonies, the commandments of God, and we're to keep the law of God ever before us. Daily. Why? Because the word of God is very pure. And that's how we gain purity of character, by meditating on the Word. I was thrilled this week because I got a text from uh, a dear friend. And and I had given her a verse, and she said, I think about that text over and over all through the day. And I thought, praise God, that's what we need to do. That's what we should be doing if we're going to be building characters like the wise virgins had that made it through the door. Okay, do I have a reader there under number two at the top of page nine in our booklet, please? This is out of Christ Object Lessons. How often are we to review? Receive. Is that when you're asking? Yes. It is the love of God continually transferred to man that enables him to impart light. Christ Object Lessons, page 428 and 418. There will be light in every dwelling of the saints. Christ Object Lessons, 431. Bringing the poor that are cast out to thy house. Then shall thy light break forth. Christ Object Lesson 426. Thank you. And on 420 she says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And of course that's Isaiah 60, verse 1. And she makes this comment. She says, To those who go out to meet the bridegroom is this message given. So the light of truth will be with those who obey the midnight cry message, which is the loud cry message, which is the straight testimony that sets us apart out away from those who are continually imbibing in new errors. So to those who go out is this message given. Isaiah 60 verse 1. Okay, number three. Can we teach the truth without the aid of the Holy Spirit? This is from 60... 399. Do I have a reader for 
It is not the human agent that moves the soul. Heavenly intelligences cooperate with the human agent and impress the truth upon the heart. Thank you. So the closer we keep to Christ and the more meek and lowly and self-distrustful trustful we are, the firmer will be our hold on Christ. That's in that same paragraph. Heavenly intelligences cooperate with the human agent, agent and impresses the truth upon our hearts. I pray that we will be impressionable and not have the heart of stone that the Word of God speaks of. Number four, do I have a reader for that one? In our book. Was the church in the time of Christ a channel for light and truth? No, they became a channel of darkness, for they slew the Son of Light. That's right. Has anything changed? Has anything changed in the so-called churches today? No. In reading in early writings, page 260, it says, Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place. And that's not the one I wanted. I wanted the one where she says um, that as the Jews slew the Son of God, so the churches have have um, slain these messages of, of the um, three angels' messages. So nothing has changed. There's still a war against the truth going on with those who call themselves God's people. Um, And I'm not finding it. I thought I had it open to that page, but I obviously turned it. So we'll go on here because we got a lot to cover. Um, Who is now to be the channel of light? Who is now to be the channel of light? Let's first look in the scriptures. We can find it there in 60, 11, and 12, and I will have somebody read that. But let's go to Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. Do I have a reader for Deuteronomy 7, verse verse 6? For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Thank you. So, from the very beginning of the Word of God, Moses' time, God designated his ecclesia, his called out of Egypt, to be a holy people, the chosen of God. Let's now look at Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. Do I have a reader? Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nation, which shall hear all these statues and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statues and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. So do you think that God wanted this to be the testimony of the denomination 
that arose in 1844 to finish the work of preparing a people for heaven on, on this planet? I believe that was his plan. But the movement was hijacked. Satan took over. Ephesians 3, 8 and 9. Ephesians 3, 8 and 9. Do I have a reader? Ephesians 3, 8 and 9. Who am less than the least of all saints is the grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Thank you. So in Paul's day, this was still God's desire was to see a people that would be a light to the Gentiles and would be, bring people to God and to Jesus Christ, his son. 1 Corinthians 4.9 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Do I have a reader? Well, I think that God has set forth us, the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, unto the angels, and to men. Unto the world, and to who? And to men. To angels and to men. We forget that we're on closed circuit TV for the whole universe to watch. And can you imagine those angels who are the ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who should be heirs of salvation? Can you imagine those angels just looking over the battlements of heaven and saying, Oh, oh, don't do that. Uh, oh, choose Christ today just with intensity longing to see us make the right decisions and stand against the rebel and his unworthy cause. We need to picture that more often because it will keep us in the straight and narrow way even when we're alone. Even when we're alone. Now that we've had a few scriptures, let's go to um, 60, 11, and 12. This is at uh, the bottom of uh, page 11, 60, page 11, God's people are to be channels. Someone want to read that paragraph for us? Okay. God's people are to be ch channels. For the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. In Zachariah's vision, the two olive trees which stand before God are represented as emptying the golden oil out of themselves through golden tubes into the bowl of the sanctuary. From this, the lamps of the sanctuary are fed that they may give a continuous bright and shining light. So from the uh, anointed ones that stand in God's presence, the fullness of divine light and love and power is imparted to his people, that they may impart to others life and joy and refreshing. They are to become channels through which divine instrumentalities communicate to the world the tide of God's love. Thank you, Sister Cheryl. And so we see that the law of God, when exemplified in our life, even the world will recognize the superiority of those who love and fear and serve the God of heaven above every other people on earth. Satan is constantly urging men to accept his principles 
Thus, he seeks to counterwork the work of God. And this is why sanctification is called the work of a lifetime, because he is Satan is ever near to tempt us and make us fall back into sin. And we have to ever be on our guard so that we can become these channels of light through which God's love and mercy can can flow to a world that needs light. How do the wise have a reserve of oil? How do the wise have a reserve of oil? This is found on pa- in 60 on page 117. 60, 117. Anyone want to read it for us? Top of 117, the capacity. The capacity for receiving the holy oil from the two olive trees is increased as the receiver empties that holy oil out of himself in word and action to supply the necessities of other souls. Work, precious, satisfying work, to be constantly receiving and constantly imparting. Read the next paragraph too, please, sister. We need and must have fresh supplies every day. And how many souls we may help by communicating to them. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and a blessing to others. I have no fear that any will make blundering work if they will only become one with Christ. Amen. If he is abiding with us, he, we shall work continuously and solidly so that our work will abide. The divine fullness will flow through the consecrated human agent to be given forth to others. Amen. Thank you. And I just want to make a comment here. It says, I have no fear that any will make blundering work if they will only become one with Christ. This is our plea every day. And I can remember a time when um, I was accosted by a lady. She demanded to know why I dressed the way I did and I had I had something I was going to say I had verses I was going to share with her out of scripture and etc and suddenly I just was tongue-tied and I prayed and I said Lord help me I, I can't remember how anything goes or what's what to say and I said well I finally said well, well I you know it's it's between me and God and and um I don't know. Go study it out. Go study it out for yourself. Weeks later, she came back to me and she said, I was ready for a battle. If you'd have given me one verse, I'd have torn you to shreds. She said, I knew them all. And she says, I went home with your humble reply. I went home and I got on my knees and I said, okay, Lord, what would you have me do? And she says, I've been studying it. And look at me. She said, <laughs> she'd been sewing. And she did. She looked a lady that she was and and so this is true we have to stay connected to the lord and like sister white said i have no fear that any will make blundering work if they will only become one with christ sometimes he'll tell you just shut up just just be quiet there's nothing to say right now (laughs) we've got to know we've got to be in tune to hear that um notebook leaflets Volume 1, page 27 says, Everyone who is connected with God will impart light to others. Get this. This is interesting. If there are any who have no light to give, it is because they have no connection with the source of light. So don't tell me, oh, I just can't give out books. I can't say anything to anybody. That's just not my gift. You know, I, 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 I haven't figured out what my talents are. You need to get connected. You need to get connected. Everyone who is connected with God will impart 
light to others. If there are any who have no light to give, it is because they have no connection with the source of light. Heavy, but true. Will the church leaders be in charge in the outpouring of the latter rain? Top of page 10. Somebody want to read TM 300 for us. Yeah, I want to read that because we, my husband and I said that often to ourselves, this quote. Okay. Let me tell you that the Lord will work. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God, to dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the results, or the reins, excuse me, in his own hands. Testimonies to Ministers 300. Amen. And Anna had a quote here on the side from 5T80, so I looked it up. And it says this, In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. They are self-sufficient, independent of God, and he cannot use them. The Lord has faithful servants who in the shaking, testing time will dispute excuse me, will be disclosed to view. There are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, and that reminds me of the quote, I don't know if I can find it here in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, where she tells us that um, that no, it's not on the page I thought it was on. She tells us that God's men have never been popular. Never been popular. So if you see somebody that's gaining his crowds and got tons and tons of views on everything he posts, whatever, that seems to be the way it's going since COVID, just know that um, God's true men are never popular. Mark Mark always says to me, Honey, the day we get a big following is the day we better get on our knees and, and repent before the Lord and tell him we want to come back to the truth. <laughs> That's what he's told me for years. Okay. So, the leaders of the churches will not lead out in the truth. And... Now we move on to number eight. What was the sin of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the church leaders that opposed Moses? What was their sin? Selfishness? Well, that was at the bottom right. of it. It says here, they they said, we are holy. Every one of the congregation was holy. But you hit the nail on the head. First off, I want to go to, um, I think it's Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 297. Um, it says... Well, on 296, starting out in this Korah, Dathan, and Abiram chapter, this is volume one of the Spirit of Prophecy, is, it says, The Lord knew that Korah was rebellious at heart and was secretly at work against Moses in the congregation of Israel. He was not satisfied with his position. And yes, that's selfishness through and through. To want to come up higher and have more praise of men, that's selfishness, Sister Deb. So you're right. On 297, it says, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and 250 princes who joined them first became jealous, then envious, and next rebellious. So we want to look for a second at jealous. What does jealous, what's the difference between jealousy and envy? Well, jealous means suspicious, 
fearful uh, that we don't have the first place or the first love of somebody in a, in their heart. Um, it's emulous, which means full of competition. So that's what jealous means. Now we move to envy, and the dictionary definition says envy is malice to see against or to look against someone, be against them. Look with enmity. What's enmity? Hatred. Hatred. Right, hatred. <laughs> to grudge, to hate. So Korah had hatred in his heart for the one who was in charge, and that was Moses. I don't think he really realized that there's a man who didn't sleep at night because he had over a million people to babysit. I don't think it was an enviable position at all. But Cora seemed to think that he was the man for the job. He didn't realize what a whole lot of headache and work it was, did he? So jealousy led to envy, and that led to what? Rebellion. You're right. It was a spiral down, Matt. You're right. To rebellion. So this was the sin of these leaders who said to Moses, Look here. This whole congregation, is the whole church is holy. We've baptized this thing, and it doesn't matter what these people are doing. We've adventized it, and so they're not in the wrong. Why are you always picking on them? This was their spirit. They said Moses was too harsh, too dictatorial, and that he was in the wrong. Cora had to hear... Yeah, I, Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I don't... I, I think... Uh, it was in my free Cora, Mason, and I, Brown, I think they didn't want to hear what they were doing wrong. They only wanted to hear what they were doing good. That's right. In, that, in a nutshell, they said... We are the people of God. Therefore, we can do no wrong. Right. And we're justified because God had chosen them so they could do whatever they want. Hmm. Same sentiments today, huh? Korah had cherished his envy and rebellion. This is on page 300 of Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, if you have that volume. He, okay. He had cherished his envy and rebellion until he was self-deceived, and he really thought that the congregation was a very righteous people, and that Moses was a tyrannical ruler, continually dwelling upon the necessity of the congregations being holy, when there was no need of it, for they were holy. It reminds me of what we went through before we were cast out. A minister saying, just come to church and you'll be okay. Just shut up, sit down, pay us your tithe and offering and you'll be okay. And we said, really? And he says, yeah, Satan can't come in this church. He can't come into this building. <laughs> My husband started laughing. I said, you got to be kidding. Christ went to church one day and a demoniac came screaming in and, and messed up the whole place until Jesus cast the devils out of the man. And that was in... The presence, the very presence of the Son of the living God. How do you think that Satan couldn't come in here? We left him speechless and very angry. Very angry. I guess that's why we can't really talk to people in the church now, because they think they're, they can't do any wrong. Correct. You know, they think they're saved by being in the church, but now that you've said that, that's why they think that they're doing right and won't listen to anybody else. Right. And that takes us... Go ahead. I was saying self-righteousness. <laughs> yes, very much so. Let's turn to Revelation 3. Let's turn to Revelation 3. 17 because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked this is the Laodicean condition 
hard to reach when we think we're just about right when we're all wrong. These rebellious ones had flattered the people. Flattery will get you nowhere. I see flattery all the time around me in public as we're working with people. There's flattery, this flattery, that. And it scares me. The um, King Solomon, he said um, that the flatterer spreadeth a net for your feet. So if somebody flatters you, heads up. Don't let it go to your head. Don't say, oh, wow, they like me. Watch it because the flatterer is spreading a net for your feet. These rebellious ones had flattered the people in general to believe that they were right and that all their troubles arose from Moses, their ruler, who was continually reminding of them of their sins. The people thought that if Korah could lead them and encourage them and dwell upon their right act, righteous acts instead of reminding them of the, their failures, they should have a very peaceful, prosperous journey. And he would without doubt lead them not backward and forward in the, des in the wilderness, but into the promised land. Um, I was going to read a quote here, but I closed my book and I don't know where it is now. Maybe I'm in the wrong one. Korah, in his self-exalted self-confidence, gathered all the congregation against Moses and Aaron unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. They saw the glory of the Lord, and yet they were so wrapped up in this whole movement, this religious movement from Korah that said, wow, you guys are really good. The people, after seeing Korah, Dathan, and Abiram taken down, this is over on 303, <coughs> excuse me, the t people were disappointed in the matters resulting as it did in favor of Moses and Aaron. The appearance of Korah and his company all impiously exercising the priest's company, excuse me, all impiously exercising the priest's office with their censors struck the people with admiration. They did not see that these men were offering a daring affront to the divine majesty. When they were destroyed, the people were terrified. But after a short time, all came in a tumultuous manner to Moses and Aaron and charged them with the blood of these men who had perished by the hand of God. And there died in the plague 14,700 besides them that died about the matter of Korah. So what happened with the sympathizers of the rebellion? Those who sympathized, this is from a Review and Herald, May 24, 1898. Review and Herald, May 24, 1898. Those who sympathized with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in their apostasy brought blight and death upon themselves. So it will be in these last days. The cause of Christ will be betrayed. Those who have had the light of truth and have enjoyed its blessings, but who have turned away from it will fight down the Spirit of God. Inspired with a spirit from beneath, they will tear down that which they once built up and show to all reasonable, God-fearing souls that they cannot be trusted. They may lay claim to truth and righteousness, but their spirit and works will testify that they are betrayers of their Lord. Get this. The attributes of Satan they call the movings of the Holy Spirit. Frightful position to be in. Frightful. Sister White says, The Lord has a remnant people that will be saved and go through to the kingdom. It remains with each of us as individuals whether or not we will be one of that number as related. Um, okay, that 
that's the quote of where it was found. Um, she says, you may see things in my son Willie you do not approve of. I make mistakes and my son Willie makes mistakes. I may be lost. My son Willie may be lost. But the Lord has a remnant people. So let us realize that each one of us must, number one, look to our, se- our own failings and, and present them before the Lord and not put anybody up on a pedestal as were Korah, Dathan, and Abiram because that will bring us to a fall. That will definitely bring us to a fall. Their sin was that they said the whole congregation is holy, every one of them. And this is the sin of the stars or angels or leaders of Laodicea. Let's look for our last text to Revelation 1, verse 20. Revelation 1, verse 20. Do I have a reader? The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So angels represent, um, another word for angels is messengers of mercy. So the messengers would be the preachers, the leaders, the heads of that, that movement. And we're, I'm looking at the time. We've only got a few minutes, and I do want to hear some comments and stuff from others. So we're going to stop right here um, and pick this up next week at number 10. So we didn't get through Lesson 3 today. And we just looked at, I just read, I guess, this... Sorry, I just read this May 24, 1898 one on it's not all right to sympathize. And think about it. Think about the third of the angels that fell with Lucifer. We are told that many of them did not believe his position, but they sympathized with, quote, how he was treated by God the Father and God the Son. So that's scary. Sympathizing with wrongdoers in any given situation, can lead to our demise. Any comments on this lesson? Anything I breezed over that you think should be brought out? Um, Speak now. (laughs) I am grateful that the Lord has given us this ten virgin parable that was brought to Ellen White's attention many times. She was often referred by the angels to the ten virgin parable because it is the parable for the church at the last before the door of probation closes. And... I feel that we're still in kindergarten class when we should have been miles and years ahead with this message that we've been entrusted with. There's a world that is absolutely sin sick. The depths of which we don't even realize. And we're so busy playing around. And this COVID really did bring out, this crisis really did bring out the character traits of many. I had many, many, many Sabbath-keeping Christians comment to me how upset they were. They couldn't shop as normal. I'm still amazed by it. I am still literally amazed by it. If this is where we are, we're going to be among those foolish that find the door shut when they get there. Let us bow before the Lord. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning grateful that you love us enough to reprove, rebuke, and chasten us. 
I pray that each one of us will examine ourselves to see if we truly be in the faith. That you will send that comforting spirit to us that we might learn what we are and learn what we must be in order to stand in the sight of a holy God. O Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Help us to live reflecting thy love and glory. And may the world see that we have been with Christ. May our homes be a little heaven on earth. Help us to trust you so much that we do not allow Satan one moment to get us to doubt or disbelieve your leading. And I pray that you will help us to be found ready and worthy to go in with the bridegroom before the door is shut. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the entrance that we can have into the most holy place by faith in the atoning blood of Christ. And Lord, as we have seen so clearly this week, this past few weeks, truly we are out of time. Help us to be faithful, each one in his corner, her corner, to do the work that you've committed to each one of us. We love you, we bless you, we worship you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen.